unless the Creator of God revealed it to us. Did God reveal it to us? Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, mentioned about God, who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, had in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he had appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. The diligent Bible student will know that in this timeline, there are three ages. The patriarchal age, right from the creation, from Adam and Eve, right to the giving of the uh, Ten Commandments to Moses. We have what we call the patriarchal age, where God deals with the fathers of individual families. God deals individually directly with Adam. God deals individually and directly with Abraham, uh, Abraham, God deals individually and directly with Noah. And each instructions and commandments are different because God deals with the fathers of the families. Right? And, and in the second in the next period will be called the Mosaical Age, when Moses received the Ten Commandments from at Mount Sinai. And this is binding on the whole nation of Israel. So we call that the Mosaic Age, right? And right down to uh, Jesus was kneeled on the cross, and in Acts chapter 2, when the, ch when the church was established, then we have what I call the Christian Age. He went unto the end of the world, right? That the Christian Age. Yes, we are now living not in the practical age, not in the Mosaic Age, but in the Christian Age. Yes, in which era? <coughs> Period. God has spoken in the practical age. God has spoken in the mosaic age. God has spoken in the Christian age. Yes, Christianity is a revealed religion. God has revealed it to us. Unless and until the Creator revealed it to us, we, with our uh, finite minds, will never comprehend the, the infinite minds. Right? And that's why we need to know uh, God's revelation. And thank God. God has spoken, and God has spoken words has been written in the book which we call the Bible. So, that is good news. Because we do not have to speculate. We, not, we do not have to invent worship, so to speak. Because God has spoken. Right? In John chapter 4, verses 23 to 24, in a scripture reading this morning, Jesus mentioned, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit and that they worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Elsewhere in the Bible, we also have been told there are four types of worship. First, is a vain worship recorded in Matthew chapter 15, verse 9. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Vain worship, meaning empty, of come to naught, zero, useless. Right? When we worship, According to the doctrines and commandments of men, that is everything in vain. It's very sad. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. There is another worship, as recorded in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, about hypocritical worship. These people
people, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Okay? Uh, hypocritical worship. Right? It's only the outward form. Right? Then what about the real worship as recorded in Colossians 2, 22 and 23? That is when we worship according to our view. It's my way, not your way, not God's way. It's my way. I feel like doing this way. Real worship. And the other one is in spirit and in truth in John chapter 4, verse 24. Question. Which of the four worships mentioned in the Bible does God seek? For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Did God leave it to our discretion? Did God leave it to our intuition? Did God leave it? Ayah, you suka suka. Or did God seek such to worship Him? So, which God seeks? Is it one word? Is it way worship that God seeks? Is it hypocritical worship? Is it view worship? Or is it a worship that is in spirit and in truth? The Bible speaks very clearly and emphatically that. God is a spirit and that they worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is what he said. Yes, in John chapter 4, verse 24, there are three things that we can learn. Number one, God is the object of our worship. Not the stones, not the mountain, not the sun, not the moon. Not the whatever golden calf that we can think of. God is the object of our worship. Right. And since God is the object of our worship, then we need to know what God desires. What God seeks. Okay? He explained very clearly in John chapter 4, verse 24, that the type of worship must have an attitude of in spirit. That all the actions of worship, all the acts of worship, must be in truth. Let's get more into it. What is true worship? Sometimes we also overlook the significance and importance of this small little word, must. Must. When the manner in which a thing is to be done is specified as a must, then it has to be done only in that manner so stated and no other way. Worship God must be in spirit. Worship God must be in truth. No other way. There is no alternative. No personal choice. It must be of a certain nature. And it must be in spirit and in truth. Question. Which is more important? In spirit or in truth? Let us examine together okay, these two questions. Then we consider the implications. In spirit. In spirit. To worship God in spirit means to worship Him with all sincerity. Right? As opposed to being hypocritical. Hypocritical. Hypocrite means, and hypocrite means come from the word called an actor. It's just acting. Okay? The world of meaning, of sincerity. It's just an acting. Right? So to worship God in spirit means to worship Him with all sincerity, with all the proper understanding. Right? The worship must be prompted by proper motives. Right? God dislikes insincerity. Okay? In uh, Matthew 7, verse 6, as we mentioned earlier, uh, He answered and said unto them, Where has Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 